Hi everybody, my name is Amanda and I'm an early childhood educator facilitator with the Durham District School Board. And I'm Diane and I am also an early childhood educator facilitator with the Durham District School Board. Today we are doing episode one of the Early Years podcast and we are talking about counting principles in kindergarten. We are talking about them because they're so important for educators to understand these counting principles to deepen our understanding of the number sense in early years. And so this episode will focus on that understanding and how we as educators can be better equipped to help our youngest learners understand numbers and what they mean. With this episode of the podcast, what we're going to be doing is discussing the counting principles and how it pertains to math in kindergarten. We are actually doing this as a slideshow, so these slides will be available for you to use. We'll put the link down in the show notes so that you can go and take a look at these slides if this is something that uh, you want to come back to later and you want to review your learning. So make sure you go take a look at those show notes if that's something you're interested in. Great. So I guess the question is, what are the counting principles? And we have lists here that there are 10 of them, but in truth, there are eight counting principles and two additional strategies that will really help support children in the learning of um, mathematical numbers, the number sense, and, and about deepening their conceptual understanding of what counting is and what the number really represents. So from my understanding, we want to move away from just rote counting to that conceptual understanding of what counting is and what each of the numbers represents. Absolutely. You know, a long time ago, we thought that when children could one, two, three, four, five, count up to 100 and so on, that they had an understanding of what the number is. But a number is a symbol, it's a quantity, and it can be represented in a multitude of, way, a multitude of ways um, and broken open uh, to compose and decompose those numbers. Perceptual subitizing. Uh, this is when you can just see a number. I look at the table we're sitting at. I know that there's two drinks on the table. I didn't even have to count them. I look at a dice and I see that there's just three. Children can naturally subitize to around five when they are coming up to five years old. So that grows over time. Yeah, so if you're looking at a dice, you see the three dots in the dice, you know that's three, you didn't count the dots in the dice. That would be perceptual supertizing. Yes. The next one that we look at is called conceptual supertizing. And again, this is a strategy, not yes. a principle technically, but we're including this in here because yes. it's important for us to understand as educators. And I think that this is a great skill for children taking forward, right? We know that our teacher colleagues have shared with us that subitizing is such an important thing that lays foundations for math and higher grades. So conceptual subitizing is different. It's where um, you see things clustered. So I might see that there's two drinks on the table and one iPad and one microphone. So I go two, one, one, and I know that that's four. Yes. So you might see two groups of three dots and just automatically know that that's six without having to count each of the individual dots. Or you might see a cluster of four squares with one more on the side and know that four and one together makes five. Well, I love that you just explained that visual that I'm looking at in, in looking at like a dice that says four and then one more. Because when I look at that, I see two on in a top row and three in a bottom row. So that's a great way to engage the children's thinking and that gives them that conceptual subitizing piece. How is it that your brain sees this? There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer, but it helps them to develop all of these conceptual skills so that they are able to um, think outside the box and, and we want them thinking critically and looking at things differently. Conceptual subitizing is a great way for youngest learners to develop those skills. Yes, and this is perfect for math talks when you're talking to your students about conceptual subitizing. In the classroom, you can do math talks, and then when they are saying that they see the number five, asking them how they're seeing that number five, and really showing that there is different ways to see it within those patterns, and it's not just one way of looking at that group of numbers. I love that, and, and so if you included something like a 10 frame, you know, putting one on the top and four on the bottom, is it the same as five all in one row, and having those conversations? 
it's still five. And that brings in some of the other counting principles. So stable order. Stable order is really very simple, right? It's that when we're counting, numbers always stay the same. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, as opposed to one, two, four, five, seven, and where children begin to mix up the numbers. So if they count just one time all the way up to 10, does that mean that their learning is consolidated? They know how to count to 10? They knew how to count to 10 in that moment, but that doesn't mean that they've consolidated that information and that you could trust that you could report on that, for example, um, that uh, they wouldn't um, perhaps make a mistake at another time. We know that learning needs to happen in a multitude of ways and in a variety of time. And so you would want a few opportunities to see that the child is counting to 10 to be certain that they are in fact- and they and they've mastered that mastered skill. Mastered that right? skill, yes. The fourth strategy we're going to be talking about today is one-to-one -one correspondence. And that one is when you assign one number to each object and you're only counting them once. So six circles would be one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can use different strategies when you're using one-to-one -one correspondence. So sometimes we push the counters as we're counting them. Sometimes we pull them towards us. You're touching each, num uh, each object as you count them. Maybe you're taking the object and dropping them into a cup, but we wanna make sure we're offering our, our children, our students, a variety of ways to practice each of these strategies because once they move into the older grades and these objects are just printed on a page, they don't they won't be able to push and pull and, and uh, drop these items into a cup so what strategy are they going to be able to use i love that and in my classroom we would call it a strategy and so giving them those opportunities so that if you have a student who gets locked into a certain way we want them to have those variety of tools in their tool bag to help them with the skill they need love it number five is cardinality so Cardinality is when you're counting, the last count of your object is the number you have. So I count one, two, three, four, five on my fingers, for example, and I know that I have five because the last number I said is the number of my quantity. This so this can seem simple, but there is an additional uh, way you can expand the children's learning. So if I was to ask a child, please count my fingers, and they counted one, two, three, four, five, and ended at my pinky, and I said, can you show me five? where's five if they touch my pinky well that is still one in the place of five so we want the all together and so all together is additional language that they might not have consolidated yet so they might be getting there with cardinality but they might not have the whole concept yet so it's all of it and it's not just the last one that you count it's the whole group it's yes the set is yes. what is but that last number if i know that if i count one two three I have three in my set, but I also understand that that's an all together. Number six in our counting principles is movement is magnitude. So when you're counting in a sequence, the numbers are increasing by one. And if you go down, your numbers are decreasing by one, or it can be whatever you're counting by. If you're counting by twos, they're increasing by twos. And if you're going backwards by twos, they're decreasing by twos. You can often see this in a number line. As you're moving right along the number line, your numbers are increasing. And as you're going left along the number line, your numbers are decreasing. And I know that um, if students are having trouble with this, Diane had a really great strategy that you can use with your students. So a number line, we always present them in a horizontal fashion, but a thermometer is a number line in a vertical fashion and that lends itself exactly to up and down. So the numbers go up, the numbers come down, they get bigger, they get smaller. And so we just need to be careful with that bigger, smaller language, but the number is more, the number is less, those kind of things. So if you have a thermometer in your classroom or even just simply turning the number line, this is lending itself to graphing and all sorts of additional math that we will be doing. Order is irrelevant. So this is just when you uh, start counting a set of objects that you can count anywhere. We just, because we read top left corner in English, doesn't mean we have to start there when we're counting. As long as I touch one object and assign one number to it, I can start anywhere in my group and count what is in front of me.
Yes, and this is where one-to-one -one correspondence also helps because it doesn't matter where you start counting, it just matters that you're counting the whole set yes. and only counting them one at a time. Absolutely. The next um, counting principle is conservation. So this means that when you're counting a set of objects, the count stays the same whether they are close together or far apart. So if I count six dots and then I spread them out, there's, it's, there's still six dots there. They're just further apart from each other. And I know that all, Diane also had a great way to show this to her students when she had carpet time with them. And I thought this was a great way for them to see conservation in action. Right, because it's sort of hard for them because when it's apart, it looks bigger, right? So ask a group of children to stand up, count those children. How many do we have? There's five children then who've stood, for example. Ask them to move around the classroom. How many are still standing? Doesn't matter where they are in the classroom, there's still only five of them. Even though we're farther apart, even when we're close together, there's still only five people, for example, standing five, seven, however many. Yeah. And I like that this just makes the math visible to them. Yes. They can really see yes. those five or those seven students that are standing and they can really see how spreading them further apart doesn't change the number of students that That's are right. actually there. And children like those kind of silly things, right? So you're embedding this opportunity to understand conservation principle and they just are giggling and thinking it's funny. And they're participating in it. Absolutely. So abstraction is the ninth uh, counting principle. And it's that qu um, quantities can be represented by different things. So you have four squares. You have four circles. It's both four even though they're different. This is a great one for that concept of if you had three elephants and three mice, for example, there's still only three in each set. Children would, if you said which one has more, they would often default to the elephants because they're bigger. So that then invites conversations around that oral language piece where bigger doesn't mean more necessarily. It just, in that context, means bigger. And so how we use language and, and what the language means in different contexts, that's uh, helping children to get that rich understanding of what that word really, really means. That one elephant and one mouse is still one of each thing. That's right. And our last counting principle is unitizing. So the best way to talk about this is just talking about the base 10 system. And so once your count exceeds nine, the objects are grouped into the tens position. And you can also, if you have um, numbers then moved into the hundreds position as students get more comfortable with numbers, but making sure that those groups of numbers are now moved into the tens position. And we can really show students this concept by using 10 frames and grouping um, numbers up on the 10 frame. And then once you have filled a 10 frame, well, now you have one group of 10. Mm -hmm. And so this really lays the foundation for um, bigger numbers. And when you start talking about place order and decimals with the higher grades, and this is that foundation for that kind of math thinking and learning. I love that. Um, another one I've seen a lot is uh, children counting popsicle sticks or, or stuff, for example, putting it um, an elastic around it, put it in the cup, we have a group of 10. And it just begins to put them into those fives, tens ideas in their head. So amazing. So those were the 10 counting principles. And we wanted to make sure we ended this podcast by talking about the noticing and naming of the math learning that's happening in the classroom. Because noticing and naming of that math learning as it happens is so important for our students and for the children in our classrooms to get them understanding the, that numbers are all around them. Absolutely. And we know through research that math is a great equalizer. It doesn't matter what your gender, it doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. Math ability in younger grades is a predictor of your future successes in school. So it's a call to us in the early years to really be able to name the math learning. So Amanda, from when you woke up this morning, what kind of math were you using? Well, I had to look at my time on my clock and make sure that I wasn't getting up too late. So I had to predict how much time it would take me to get ready in the morning. So thinking about the the time and the amount of time I had, mm -hmm. um, how fast I was driving when I was driving to work, looking at the numbers, was it equal to what the speed limit is? Or maybe it was bigger than the <laughs> speed limit. So yeah, we are using math 
all the time. Yes, and that doesn't take into account how much or how little you put into your lunch bag and all of those thoughts that you have to, that is math all the time. And so what we know from research is that when we're noticing and naming, I see you've patterned, I see you've sorted, you know, measurement, whatever it is, the math that you're doing and simply calling it, we're going to do math centers and having different things isn't quite enough to get the children to make that leap. Name it math, call it math. We're lining up. Oh, one, two, three, four. I'm using my one-to-one -one correspondence by when I'm touching you and I say a number, um, oh, you're in front of, you're behind, please move here beside. All those positional words, all of that stuff. Oh my goodness, boys and girls, I thought we were just lining up to go to the library, we're practicing our math too. Yes, and making sure that you're talking about the math that you're doing throughout the day. Yes. And it's not only happening during math centers, you're doing math inside, outside the classroom, whenever the opportunity comes up to just talk about that math that's happening. So if we're lining up to get on a bus and I'm again, counting each student mm -hmm. and tapping them on the head as I walk by and showing them that one-to-one -one correspondence, saying those numbers out loud yes. and saying, oh, I've counted 26, we have 26 students in our class. Do we have everybody? Is 26 equal to 26? Talking about that. And then when they're on the bus, if they're sitting by twos, say, oh, I can skip count by twos while you're counting them and really just naming that learning that is happening throughout the day, how you're using that math. Yes. And I think that we, you know, we're so accustomed to doing it, but we don't, you know, their brains are always open and we're always looking to be able to put that information in and build those neural pathways for the children. So we don't know necessarily when that's going to consolidate for them. So when they're having their lunch and I say, oh, how many carrots do you have today? We're, you know, we're, oh my goodness, I thought you were eating lunch. We're, we're practicing math. And that way children begin to see themselves as a math learner so that when they are increasing in grades and math, you know, they're saying is getting harder well, you've always been a math learner. You've always done math. We know that toddlers will hold shapes of objects and look at them and compare them to see if they're the same. They don't necessarily even have the language yet, but their brain is thinking in that way. And, you know, to younger and younger. So it's a call to us to be naming that math and having the children naming their own math. Yeah, too. and especially these... Um these counting principles, as you see them arising with your students in the classroom, noticing those counting principles and really calling attention to them and making sure that the students know that these are different things that they're doing within their math learning that are very important. And I would use a lot of the terminology in my classroom with the children, because if we want to believe that children are curious, capable and competent, when you name something for them, then that's what it's called. And so I don't hesitate with using those big words because they like them. Go home and tell your family you understand abstraction or, you know, I can subitize. Yes, and, especially and during math talks. That's a great time to talk absolutely. about subitizing with your students and they'll get it. They will get it. So I hope everybody enjoyed our first episode of the Early Years podcast. And we had a great time talking about these different uh, math strategies and principles that we use within the kindergarten classroom. I hope you will join us next time on our next episode of the Early Years podcast.